So good morning all, welcome to the Southern Africa Food Security Outlook Briefing where we're covering the June 2022 to January 2023 period. I'm Beth Weeks, a Senior Food Security Analyst and I'm joined by Elizabeth Calderon, also a Senior Food Security Analyst who'll be, who will be presenting later on in the presentation. So today, as we typically do with our Outlook briefings, we'll go through an overview of FuseNet's approach to early warning analysis, our key messages, and then dive into our regional overview before covering our key areas of concern in the region, Southern Madagascar and Zimbabwe. So for FuseNet's method for early warning analysis, we rely on scenario development to produce our projections of acute food insecurity up to eight months in the future. We start by selecting a population group and analyzing the, how their livelihood system allows them to produce or purchase their minimum food needs. And then we develop evidence-based assumptions about how ongoing or expected shocks will affect their ability to do that. These assumptions feed into our analysis, which put in the most simple, simple terms is analysis of the extent to which household food and income will or won't cover their food needs over the coming months. This is then translated into our food security projections. To classify the severity of acute food insecurity, FuseNet uses the Global Integrated Phase Classification Scale. The scale consists of five phases of severity and at levels three and above known as crisis, IPC phase three, emergency, IPC phase four, and catastrophe, IPC phase five, households need urgent food assistance to prevent or mitigate the severity of food consumption gaps and acute malnutrition. When at least 20% of the population in a given area is experiencing the conditions that define a certain IPC phase, then we map that phase. And I'd also like to note when emergency IPC phase four outcomes are mapped, we do expect large food consumption gaps and elevated levels of acute malnutrition and hunger related mortality. FuseNet also covers country in which we do not have a presence. And in these countries, we do an outline of the highest area level phase classification within that country and you'll see that denoted on our maps. Additionally, on our mapping, we have an exclamation point where the phase classification would likely be at least one phase worse without current or programmed humanitarian assistance. So taking a look for the seasonal calendar in a typical year, in June and July, we're seeing the harvest wrap up with the second season harvest in southern Mozambique and in other areas of the country begin, as well as the tobacco and cotton sales and auction are wrapping up, which predominantly occur in Zimbabwe and Malawi. As we head through the middle part of our projection period in August to November, there are there is the wheat and winter harvest that occur in areas of the region, and we see the start of the land preparation and main, main planting season for the next consumption year. The rainy season begins in October with the lean season, which doesn't typically start till November across most of the region. However, there is some country level variation in the start of the lean season where it can begin as early as October, typically in some areas of the region. Now throughout the now for the rest of the projection period, we expect that the rainy season will continue as well as the lean season with planting ongoing. So taking a look at our key messages for our presentation today, 2022 production was near to below average across the region. This is due to poor rainfall, tropical cyclones, conflict, and high agri agricultural input costs. However, we do expect that the maize supply will be near average regionally, which is driven largely due to the above average opening stocks um, for this marketing year. Food prices have seasonally decreased in June with the completion of the harvest. However, due to elevated transportation costs and high global food, 
high global food prices as well as fuel prices are maintaining food prices within the region at well above average levels. Conflict remains the major driver of food insecurity in parts of DRC and Mozambique, where we're also seeing in Zimbabwe mac unstable macroeconomic conditions, where we're seeing sharp declines in the value of the Zimbabwean dollar and increasing inflation. In Madagascar, extreme food insecurity persists where large-scale assistance needs are expected to continue due to the severe drought and consecutive droughts that we've seen during the past rainy seasons. Emergency outcomes are expected in southwestern areas of Madagascar in late 2022, with widespread crisis outcomes in many parts of the region due to the disruption of the agricultural season in, in conflict-affected areas, as well as in areas where we saw poor rainfall, as well as tropical cyclones. Regionally, assistance needs during the start of the 2022-2023 lean season will most likely be above average, driven by moderate increases in needs across most countries in the region. However, we do expect needs in Zimbabwe will be near average. So, so looking now to the current situation and to situate ourselves in the current situation, we wanted to take a step back and look at how the 2021-2022 rainfall season performed. So temporal distribution of rainfall was very poor across many areas of the, of the region. These graphs are showing chirp rainfall anomalies by chirps for January on the left, February in the center, and March on the right. The pink to yellow colors are showing rainfall anomalies that are below average, while the light green to dark blue colors are showing above average or favorable rainfall conditions. So in January, we did see that there were generally favor there was generally favorable re rainfall across much of the region. However, I would note that we saw poor rainfall in areas of southern Madagascar as well as southern Mozambique. Now we did see a large dry spell in February across Zimbabwe, much of Mozambique, areas of northern South Africa, as well as southern Malawi. Now January and February rainfall are especially important in southern Africa, not only due, due to the ability for households to plant in January, but also this is the prime time for crop development. So due to the poor rainfall in February, we did see that there was permanent crop wilting as well as moisture stress to crops. Now in March, we did see that there was improvement in rainfall across areas of the region. However, due to the poor rainfall that led to that permanent stress of crops in February, this rainfall did not lead to significant improvements in cropping conditions. So now taking a look to the production for 2022, and this map on the left is showing maize conditions as of May 2022. So the the as the harvest is wrapping up based on analysis by GeoGlam. So this map is showing the conditions for the end of the season, where the green colors are showing generally favorable conditions where average production to slightly above average production is expected. In areas where we see the yellow colors, which are considered watch. This is the areas where production is expected to be around average. While in the orange colors, we can where we see this in southern Mozambique, uh, many areas of Madagascar, and some isolated areas of Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Angola, the, where we're seeing poor conditions, um, where we expect poor yields. And these orange colors mean that we are expected to see around a 20 to 25 percent loss in production. I would like to note, though, that based on FuseNet field assessments in areas of Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Malawi, that there are some areas where we expect production to be even that is likely lower than what is estimated on this graph. So. 
looking to how the production in the region has influenced regional maize supply estimates. Now, regional supply is important in Southern Africa as markets are well integrated within the region, as well as the contribution of South Africa to the overall marketing system in the region. So for the 2022-23 marketing year, overall regional supply is expected to be near average. While production is expected to be slightly below average, this is largely due to the well above average opening stocks from the previous marketing year. I'd also like to note that the five-year average does include previous poor seasons from about 2018 to 2020, where the, product, where the region was facing consecutive droughts. So while regional supply is expected to be near average, we do expect that market supply, that the regional supply will be thin. And this is largely due to the exports from South Africa to not only East Africa, but the larger global market. So while South Africa is exporting to the international market, they will be able to fill, they will be trading within the region. However, this is not, this is expected to, the international trade is expected to impact somewhat the ability, South Africa's trade within the region. So now looking at macroeconomic conditions and fuel prices in the region. So due to the compounding impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, high international food and fuel prices, high import costs, economies in the region are experiencing elevated inflation rates. The infl inflation rates in the region are highest in Angola, Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. While the inflation rate in Zimbabwe is quite concerning. Elizabeth will be covering that a little bit later on in the presentation in a bit more detail. Addition, these macroeconomic conditions are largely due to the high fuel prices as well as intern as well as the global economic situation that we are seeing due to the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the Ukraine crisis. So these macroeconomic conditions are putting pressure on poor and urban households for as this is limiting their household financial access to food. So taking a look at some of the fuel prices in various countries in the region from August 2020 to June 2022, we can see that from August to about January 2022, there was a general increasing trend in fuel prices across the region. However, in 2022, we've seen a stark increase in those fuel prices, which is leading to high transportation costs within the region for goods and food commodities. I'd like to note specifically in Malawi, the government has increased fuel prices by over 60 percentage points since the start of the year. So due to the inflationary market pressures, the somewhat thin supply in the region, in, and the prices remain elevated. Now in June, as the harvest began, we saw prices decrease in US dollar terms across most countries. Although it is important to note that in Zimbabwe, while prices declined in US dollar terms, they continue to increase in the local currency. Additionally, prices in South Africa are among the highest that we've seen following the El Nino drought in 2015-16, which is driving price tra transmission not only to countries that are well integrated with the South African economy like Lesotho, but across most markets in the region. And overall, looking to the map on the left, which is showing maize prices as a percent of the five-year change, we can see that prices are well above average across most markets in the region. So now taking a look to the conflict in the Capo Delgado region of Northern Mozambique, where, we, where conflict continues. While a slow decline in conflict incidents occurred in early 2022, which was associated with the rainy season, 
we have seen an, a, an increase in conflict events since the start, since the rainy season has ended. As you can see here by the chart on the left, which is showing the displaced populations in the green bars and the security incidences in the teal line. Generally, households, as, sorry, with the increases in security incidences, we are also seeing increased displacements. Now, generally, households that are displaced flee to towns or camps where there are some security operations and the overall security is generally better than in the rural areas. And so, and also associated with the conflict, we continue to see restricted humanitarian access as well as trader access in the Capo Delgado region. So taking a look here at the map on the right, which is showing the access constraints according to OCHA as of June 2022. This map is showing in dark blue the hard to reach areas in the, in the province with the light blue sh showing the, that access is generally available in these areas. So while humanitarians are focusing most of their operations in towns, they do sometimes try to reach some of these harder to access areas relying on military escorts for distributions. Additionally, in these in the areas that are hard to reach, there is limited, there is expected to be some but very limited market activity for households to purchase food. So overall, the conflict is leading to the disruption of livelihood and market activities, with many households had, having difficulty engaging in the 2021-2022 agricultural season and have a lower than normal harvest, which is largely due to the limited access to farmlands or, and or access to agricultural inputs. Additionally, for those who did have a harvest, there is often looting by armed actors in these areas why we're seeing that this is further reducing household access to own foods. So now taking a look at the conflict incidences in DRC from January 2019 to June 2022. Conflict in DRC continues to be concentrated in three areas, the Aturi province and North and South Kivu provinces. ACLIB reports a decrease in hostilities in um, May and June compared to early 2022. However, on the ground, there continues to be both clashes between armed groups and intercommunity conflict. This is despite an extension of the state of siege in the province of North Kivu and Ituri provinces and a pooling of operations with the Ugandan army. So fighting between arms groups has already has caused the displacement of around 100,000 people. And this can be seen by the graphic on the right, which is showing the movement of displaced populations in DRC as of June 2022, where the pie is showing the relative level of displacement with the portions of the pie indicating the number of IDPs with the blue section is indicating the number of refugees. Also, according to OCHA, OCHA alerts, from January to April across DRC, there are over 750,000 people dis newly displaced, and that there are nearly 5.6 million people internally displaced in 13 provinces in the in 13 provinces in the country. So, in DRC, conflict continues to disrupt livelihood activities as well as market activities which is leading to declines in access to food and income. So now taking a look at our key assumption for FuseNet's analysis through January 2023. So prices across the region are expected to remain well above average amid the thin regional supply, price transmission from the international markets and high transportation costs. So the, this is looking at three price projections for a market in South Africa. On the left, a market in Lesotho in the center, and then for Malawi on the right. All of these graph, graphs are showing generally well above average 
expectation for prices in the region. So, and now looking forward to the October 2022 to Gen 2023 period, which is the start of the rainy season, where FuseNet Science Partners currently anticipate above average rainfall is most likely in much of the region, with below average rainfall in northern and northeastern areas. This forecast is expected to support agricultural production. However, agricultural labor, and while agricultural labor will likely seasonally increase. It is expected to remain near to below normal in most parts of their region due to the poor payment power by better off households, conflict, and overall lower than normal purchasing power for households to access agricultural inputs. Income from non-agricultural labor is likely to be disrupted in conflict affected areas of Mozambique and DRC and lower than average in much of the region due to that low, lower than normal payment power by the better and middle off households, as well as the impacts of the generally poorer macroeconomic conditions in much of the region. As stated before, the food prices will remain elevated and overall household purchasing power is expected to remain lower than normal. So taking a look at FuseNet's projected outcomes for the June to September period, which is shown here by the map on the left, we see that in the post-harvest period that widespread crisis and stressed outcomes are expected. This is largely due to the low purchasing power we discussed, as well as the poor production, which is resulting in households being more more reliant on markets. Additionally, humanitarian assistance is mitigating food consumption gaps in Northern Mozambique, as well as in areas of Southern Madagascar. As we move to the October 2022 to January 2023 period, we expect that crisis outcomes will become more widespread across many areas of Zimbabwe, Mozambique and Malawi with an expansion to crisis in Lesotho and continued crisis outcomes in some areas of Angola. Now in Madagascar, which Elizabeth will dive into in a minute, we do expect that emergency outcomes will emerge in October as well as continue to experience widespread stress and crisis outcomes. Taking a look at how these mapping, how our mapping impacts FuseNet's food assistance needs, this graph is showing the October to 20, October 2022 to January 2023 projected assistance needs compared to the same months for 2019 to 2022. And we can see by the bar all the way to the right on this graphic that overall assistance needs are going to be somewhat similar to that that we saw in October 2020 to January 2021. Now, this is largely due to marginal increases in needs across all across most countries. However, it is however looking at this graph, we can see that needs in Zimbabwe are not expected to be as high as they were in 2019 or 2020 or 2020-2021 during the same period, although higher than last year. So FuseNet's areas of greatest concern during this period are Southern Madagascar, Eastern DRC, the Capo Delgado and Southern areas of Mozambique and Southern, Western and Northeastern Zimbabwe. So I will hand it over now to Elizabeth. Thanks, Beth. You can go ahead to the next slide. So I'll start off with Madagascar's seasonal calendar since it looks different from the regional calendar that Beth presented earlier. And our area of concern for Madagascar is in the south. So you can see their seasonality at the bottom of the calendar here. By June, the main cereal harvest has finished and the cassava harvests are normally beginning around August. From July to March is when we see peak labor demand for cash crops, and that's in north and central parts of Madagascar. You can see it at the top of the calendar here, but it is an important source of 
who would typically seasonally migrate for these labor opportunities. Lastly, I would just highlight here that the lean season in the Grand South typically lasts from December through February. Next slide. So this year, Madagascar has been hit by multiple shocks and severe drought conditions developed during this year's rainfall season. This marks the third consecutive drought in southern Madagascar, and you can see just how severe some of these negative rainfall anomalies were, especially in um, southwestern Madagascar that's shown on the map there on the left. And on the right, we're seeing the paths that several of the six different tropical storms and cyclones to hit the island this year. Um, the paths that they took across the island. And those caused flooding and considerable crop and infrastructure damage in some localized areas. You can see some of the worst impacted areas are shown in this map here in red. Uh, this is where Batsurai and Amnadi hit along the southeastern coast. Next slide, please. So both of these weather events saw negative impacts to crops, particularly in the Grand south. And on the left of this slide, we can see how the water requirement satisfaction index for maize showed some pretty large parts of the Grand South, especially towards the west, with mediocre and poor conditions, as well as quite a lot of crop failure, which is shown there in orange. According to an assessment carried out in April by Madagascar's Vulnerability Assessment Committee, Maize cropped area this season was already reduced across the south. This was due to a lack of agricultural inputs. But then we add on the severe drought conditions on top of that, and we've seen some significant declines in crop production as a result. So the MVAC estimated that across the Grand South, we saw around a 63% decline in crop production compared to normal this year. But some of those districts in the Southwest overlapping to a large degree with those orange areas you see on the map here, declines there were reported around 70% below normal. So household stocks are significantly below average, varying from around one to five months this season, depending on the location in Grand South. But the negative impacts from the drought are not just constrained to the maize harvest, but they're also negatively impacting the upcoming cassava harvest. And the below average rainfall that we saw already also contributed to really below average soil moisture conditions, which is what you're seeing in these different maps here on the right from March to May of this year. And this is likely to negatively impact the development of root and tuber crops, especially in those areas that you see where we are significantly below normal in the Southwest. In the Grand South, the harvesting of cassava would typically play, take place between August and November, but as poor households are facing food consumption gaps following those very poor maize harvests, we've heard reports that they're beginning to resort to harvesting some cassava that's not fully matured as a coping mechanism. So since they're pulling these roots out of the ground before they fully developed, this is also going to have an impact in reducing overall yields. There are also reports of reductions in the expected harvest in the southeast, and this is due to the passage of cyclones again, as some excess moisture and flooding resulted in rotting roots in those areas. So if we look at overall cassava production between both the south and the eastern producing regions, uh, the, our key informants are indicating that we should expect around 25% below the three-year average. But keep in mind that the last three years have all been consecutive drought years. But we do anticipate even lower numbers in the, the parts of southwestern Madagascar where we see these very low soil moisture conditions. Next slide, please. Now, at the national level, crop production is approximately average despite the passage of these storms, which is positive news for northern Madagascar. They did see cyclone activity there, and this is where most of vanilla is produced, but there were only moderate reported losses to vanilla and cloves there. But there were significant localized losses of rice, cassava, and coffee in eastern Madagascar. And this is what I'm showing on this slide here. This is the estimated production losses for affected food and cash crops from Batsurai and Amnadi along the eastern coast. And the losses here are measured in US dollars. So this is important for us to consider because typically poor households from the Grand South, they would take advantage of seasonal labor migration to northern and eastern parts of Madagascar during that cash crop harvest season. This type of seasonal migration has been limited in recent years due to COVID-19 restrictions, but the lifting of those restrictions this year would have allowed for the resumption of those activities. Now with the storm impacts this year, that recovery is being really constrained. 
And then I would also take it back to just within the Grand South itself, again, those below average cropped areas, below average rainfall, below average harvest, they've all adversely impacted agricultural and non-agricultural labor opportunities. So on the whole, we're expecting below average income to continue for households in the South. Next slide. And I'll move along to prices now. So we have seen seasonal price drops um, uh, for most staple foods in recent months, but prices do remain higher than the five-year average. And this is showing us the rising cost of living for households. So um, what we're seeing here on this side is observed prices for dried cassava in Ambuvumbe on the left, and then our price projections on the right. So prices of local staples such as rice, maize, and cassava are expected to remain high. And this is given the, the very below average 2022 harvests and um, here in this graph, you can see that that is true for, for the case of dried cassava, where the blue line is representing our observed prices, and uh, those gray bars along the bottom are the five-year average. Looking forward to the price projections, we are continuing to see that trend, and I would just note that there's multiple months here in our projections where we are expecting to see prices um, more or less double the five-year average. Next slide, Beth. So we're seeing similar trends across the Grand South. So this slide is looking at the same thing, observed prices for dried cassava on the left and price projections on the right, but for Ampani. And I want to highlight Ampani because of some of the increased challenges in this particular area with their extremely low harvest this year. And we're expecting, of course, that they're going... Um, markets are going to be even more dependent this year on staples being transported long distances from surplus producing areas in other regions of the country all the way down to the Ampani area. Now I raise this because we anticipate some rising gas prices to contribute to increased increases in food prices, particularly in parts of the Grand South. The government did have a freeze on fuel prices that they began in April, but they've now dropped that. And so in July, we saw gasoline prices hike by 43%, as well as diesel by 44%. And in general, the heightened reliance on markets, the below average income and higher than normal prices are reducing household purchasing power, and they're likely to continue limiting food access for very poor households. Next slide, please. This year, we have seen large-scale humanitarian assistance across the Grand South, and you can see just how high some of these levels have been during the course of the lean season in the map here on the left. But these, uh, the levels of humanitarian assistance have been reducing, given the maize harvest and given the cassava harvest, which we can see uh, in the graph on the right. Even with these reductions, we still consider there to be significant humanitarian assistance um, mitigating outcomes in Ambusari, Ampani, and Batuiki through August. But then after August, we don't have any information on planned assistance continuing. So that is a contributing factor for some of the deterioration in our maps that we expect to see from September onwards. Next slide. And if we put this back into the context of the seasonal calendar, as I mentioned before, the, the lean season would normally start around December and last through February. But this year's shocks are expected to cause an early start to the lean season. And we estimate that the population in need this year, which we're showing in the chart at the top of this slide in the red bars, that that is going to be uh, starting to grow again by around September and that it will continue to be well above the five-year average, which is shown in the gray bars. Next slide. So taking a look at our most likely food security outcomes for Madagascar, crisis and crisis exclamation points remain widespread in the Grand South as humanitarian assistance continues to mitigate those worst outcomes, especially in southwestern areas. Again, the severe drought and negative impacts of the multiple cyclone strikes have significantly reduced maize harvests, and this is driving very poor outcomes even in the post-harvest period. I would just highlight that's very atypical to have these outcomes in a post-harvest period. Furthermore, the below average soil moisture is expected to lead to uh, significant reductions in our cassava and sweet potato production. So that will lead to overall very minimal seasonal improvements and again, that early start to the lean season. So as we move then um, into the map on the right here, it's likely that emergency outcomes will begin to emerge as early as September in some parts of Andrea and, and at Simandrafana. 
after humanitarian assistance is slated to end in August. Again, these areas where we expect emergency outcomes to emerge are areas that have been worst affected by the severe drought this year. They saw some of the worst maize harvest outcomes, and we expect them to also see some of the lowest cassava and sweet potato yields. Household access across the Grand South um, to food is likely to further deteriorate just with the progression of the lean season as stocks deplete from those low harvests and prices start to seasonally rise again. And even in the areas that we expect will be able to remain in crisis during this time, we do anticipate uh, some increase in the proportion of households facing food insecurity in these areas. So along the southeastern coast where we did see the passage of cyclone causing some food insecurity there, uh, we do anticipate that the recovery is still ongoing there and these households are likely to continue experiencing stressed outcomes throughout the rest of the outlook period. Next slide. So now I'll switch gears and move into Zimbabwe, which does generally follow the regional seasonal calendar that Beth presented earlier. Next slide. And I'll zoom in here on, on the rainfall progression that Beth showed earlier, and we can see just how erratic the rainfall was over the season, specifically within Zimbabwe. Very mixed results here. And you can see in the middle of the slides where we're showing February, this dry spell is what concerned us the most. You can see how really large swaths of the country registered only 30% or less of normal rainfall during this month. Next slide. And this extended dry spell had significant consequences in Zimbabwe for maize crops. So by March, as you can see in the map here on the left, maize was showing signs of stress and wilting across really almost all of the country. And this was corroborated by field observations taken by our science partners between April and May, as you can see in the pictures here on the right. Next slide, please. Something that's really complicating matters in Zimbabwe is the high level of macroeconomic volatility. So year-on-year -year inflation um, has been steadily rising over the past several months, and you can see this in the orange line in the chart on the left. So we saw some of the worst inflation rates in Zimbabwe back in early 2022, rising up above 800%. Um, and they've stabilized over a course of time to around the 50 to 60% range during 2021. But we're concerned now that we're seeing some new spikes um, moving up in these inflation rates. So as of June, we were sitting at 192, and the figures have just now been released for July, and they're above 250% for July. Now, the Zimbabwean economy is a multi-currency system, and they use the Zimbabwean dollar and the U.S. dollar relatively interchangeably. There are also a lot of use of um, the South African rand within the country. So we do a lot of monitoring of the exchange rates to try and understand any devaluation of the local currency that's ongoing. So on the right, what we're looking at is the um, very steep devaluation of the Zimbabwean dollar. Looking at the exchange rates, the official exchange rate is seen there in orange. And then the parallel market exchange rate in cash is in red versus the parallel market exchange rate done electronically. So this is mobile money transfers that is seen here in green. And you can see just how much they've spiked since about March of this year. There's typically cash shortages in Zimbabwe and Forex is hard to access at that lower auction rate, that yellow, or I'm sorry, that orange line that you see there. So this shortage oftentimes drives businesses to increase their demand of Forex on, on parallel markets. And so that tends to drive these rates even higher. And there's a growing demand across the Zimbabwean economy in both formal and informal markets for business to really be conducted only in foreign currencies because of this volatility of the Zimbabwe. The government has tried to introduce a series of policies to encourage the use of the local currency, and that includes up to threatening to strip uh, businesses of their operating licenses. But businesses are still continuing to pursue transactions in U.S. dollars trying to in our context for a couple of reasons. And the first is that if businesses are not able to price in U.S. dollars that they are required to price in Zimbabwean dollars, there's some concerns now surfacing that manufacturers, wholesalers, and retailers are would actually hold back some of their products 
to limit those financial losses and would not sell them unless they were able to do so in foreign currencies. And this could contribute to commodity shortages in the country. Next slide. The other reason that this is important is because as more and more products are priced in USD and there's a higher demand for Forex driving up those parallel market exchange rates, some prices could be further out of reach for poor households and poor households are paid in Zimbabwean dollars. So if they need to be purchasing items in US dollars, they would be forced to exchange uh, for US dollars at parallel market exchange rates, significantly eroding their purchasing power. So spiking parallel exchange rates have driven up the prices of basic goods, as you can see in the graph here on the left. And the overall uh, food poverty lines and total consumption poverty lines are also seeing some significant increases all since around the March of 2022 line. So given this, there's um, now reports that we're hearing of households in some rural areas beginning to resort to bartering using grains and livestock in order to access goods and services to avoid some of these currency challenges. Next slide, please. And looking forward across the outlook period, these shocks are driving needs higher than last year throughout Zimbabwe. So across deficit producing areas, especially in southern Zimbabwe, crisis outcomes are beginning to emerge at area level as these areas enter into the 2022 to 23 lean season months earlier than normal. Again, that's due this year to significantly below average crop production and the macroeconomic instability we've discussed. But you can see there are some areas in the north throughout the outlook period that are still experiencing minimal food insecurity. And this is because these are surplus producing areas who had significantly above average harvests last year. So they have above average carryover stocks going into this year. And they did also see relatively better harvests this year compared to the south. As we move into the lean season, which is shown there in the map on the right, um, we are expecting to see increases in the population in need. There will be a higher market reliance as household stocks begin to exhaust and food access becomes further complicated by the devaluation of the Zimbabwean dollar, given all the price volatility that we see in the market. So this will increase the number of households facing crisis outcomes and result in these widespread crisis outcomes at area level through January. With that, I'll hand it back to you, Beth. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we'll leave you here with the projected outcomes for the outlook period, as well as our contact information. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.